Thank you. And uh, it's a good evening tonight. I'm happy that you guys all come in. We've got a really nice crowd and um, appreciate your interest in fly fishing Kansas, particularly fly fishing the wipers. Um, we're going to be probably going about an hour tonight. Um, about halfway through, I've got one slide that says um, break. We can do questions, answers. We can take a nature call, whatever we want to do at that point. But I put in a little bit of a break there so we don't get too cross-eyed because um, there's some analytical stuff that's going to be coming up and it gets kind of long if, if we don't get a little break maybe once in a while. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. As this first slide says, fly fishing is regional. And we've kind of all talked about that. You know, you picture the trout fishing that goes to the Rockies and they fish that fast water in little pockets is altogether a different technique than the trout fisher that goes to the Ozarks and maybe fishes a Spring Creek. That technique is much different. And if one of these trout fishermen was to go to Belize and hire a guide and get on a, on a boat with a, with a rover and everything, you would uh, probably get some grief if you did a trout set on, on a good, maybe bonefish hookup. The trout set would just be to jerk the rod up and your guy would be telling you, you're a trout fisherman, aren't you? And you'll say, yes. Well, I said, over here, we strip set for these fish. So that's a regional thing. Um, just last fall, there was a group of us that went to Michigan and did steelhead fishing. And you know, if you did a lot of saltwater fishing out in the open, and then you got crammed into this little river with all this timber along the shore, you'd feel a little bit confined. And it was a day and a half before I figured out how to do a drift with this big old strike indicator and all this lead weight that you had to have to run it down and get it deep into the water. So that again was another learning curve and that's what regional fly fishing is all about. We have our own region here and what I'm asking you tonight is to utilize it more, use those day trips, fill that calendar up with fishing events, and pick the things that you can go on. We have a broad diversity of types of fish in Kansas. Um, the black basses, the largemouth, the smallmouth, and the spotted bass, they all have different tendencies. So you know, they're, they're all challenging and they all fish differently. So there's just in that family alone, there's diversity. Uh, you've got the bluegill, it's got its own skill set and its own fly patterns and, and techniques. Um, carp. Carp is an altogether different ball game. You've got a lot of different technique differences there too, and these are all available to us. What we'll be talking about tonight is a temperate bass, which will be more focusing on the wipers because that's what we have mostly around here. We're going to be talking about how to play the wiper game, and we're going to be giving out some information that could maybe help change could catch some fish today to should catch some fish today. Many times when I'm out on the water, I get to meet other people. Um, most of them aren't fly fishermen. I see a few fly fishermen that fish for wipers in the lakes, but most of them are gear fishers. And when I go out there with that fly rod, saying, what the heck are you using that fly rod for? I said, well, I'm fishing for wipers. And you think about that a little bit. You said, man, I bet that's really awesome. So people that fish for wipers, it's fun, they recognize it being fun, and they are, like to wrap their head around the idea of, of bringing in a hard-fought wiper on a fly rod. It is a sport that has got high risk to it. 
If you're going to pursue this, you need to be prepared for some days when you're going to go home empty-handed. You're going to be seeing empty water. But the best laid plans are still going to happen where you're going to have no dates and days with no catching fish. But when you do, it's well worth it. Now, traditionally, we have this picture right here when we think about fishing with a fly rod in Kansas. We have a natural tendency of fly fishing a four or five acre lake, maybe in the pasture land somewhere that is stocked with largemouth bass and bluegill. But what about the opportunities that we have in the larger reservoir areas? And how do you place yourself in a position to catch fish in such a large body of water? That is the game. These are some of the obstacles that you have. Cheney's got 9,500 acres. El Dorado's got 8,000 acres and 98 miles of shoreline. Marion's got 6,100 acres. Wilson's got 9,000 acres. Milford's got 16,000 acres. So again, how do you place yourself in a position to catch fish in such large bodies of water. Before we get into that part here, I want to just talk about what other anglers think about fishing in Kansas for a minute. I've got some information here that was from an angler survey that the Fishing Game Office had done here in Kansas back in 2006, about 12 years ago. It's kind of interesting. When uh, the first question came up, was, Please rank five of your favorite species to catch in Kansas. And the highlighted areas show the double digit responses 18% uh, on channel cats, 20% on crappie, and the number one was 24% uh, on the largemouth bass, and then walleye at 16%. The tempered basses was almost a no show. And on the response, striped bass, which I understand that there's only really one spot in Kansas that you can fish for striped bass. Uh, white bass and wipers, again, pretty low numbers of people that call that their primary species fished in Kansas. Please rank the top five Kansas water areas in terms of where you prefer to fish. What kind of areas, what kind of waters are you fishing in? Well, there's four of them here that have double digit percentage responses. And I'd like to point out that federal reservoirs, one in five, only one in five, fish are reservoirs. How often do you use a boat fishing in Kansas? Sometimes, almost half. Always, almost a third. Never one in five, basically. What's your primary type of method that you fish for in Kansas? Number one, obviously, is live bait and or artificial lures. Flies, fly rod, fly fishermen, 1.3%. I'm pretty sure it's higher than that now. This is about 12 years ago, um, but still a low number of people primarily use the fly rod in the state of Kansas. So you only have 2.7% responses pick wiper as their favorite species. Only one in five responses pick reservoirs as their favorite water to fish. One in five report never fishing from watercraft. And only 1.3 primarily method to fish is with flies or with a fly rod. I'll ask you again, you fish for wipers with a fly rod? I bet that's really awesome. Yet we have just hardly anybody doing it. There's probably a reason for that. A lot of it is the lack of information that you can attain on the temperate bass family. We've got so much power and information for trout. You've got books on 
the way that the insects have their cycles, matching flies for that. You've got books on popular trout fisheries and a very good description of where to go and what time of the year and what kind of flies at the time of the year. And, and you just don't have the history in wipers as what you do like in trout. You are getting a little bit of information on the black bass, the, the smallmouth bass, the largemouth bass, and a fly rod. You do have some literature out on that, not much. The really big thing, obviously, is largemouth bass, boats, bass pro, regular gear for, for fishing for largemouth bass. That, that is the number one in Central America, and uh, there's, there's a lot of support for that. So if we're going to be fishing for tempered bass, or specifically for wipers, we really have to do our own research. I'd like to point out a few areas that I use in making decisions on building a, a possible day trip. From the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, we have a fish density forecast. That's really good to know to figure out what bodies of water have the best population of wipers in it. So at least you can know which areas you want to start thinking about going to because they have big populations there. Also, current fishing reports on their website has very good information. It's, it's um, current events and there's tips by the fisheries biologists on it. I like the weather channel. Um, I like to use the classic weather map because I can see the fronts moving in. I can see if we're going to be in a high pressure bubble. Uh, and I also like to use the hourly. On the hourly, you can, you can tell cloudness, you can tell temperature as it's going up or going down, and you can see how the wind is going to be going from hour to hour. Typically, it starts building as the day goes on, and then toward the end of the day, it starts dropping off again. So you can look for those key times when you can get clouds and good wind at the same time. Lately, I've been liking to use the underground weather website. The 10 day forecast is a really good one. Uh, besides, from, from the date, you've got, let me see if I can blow this up. Okay, uh, you can tell if you've got um, sunny days, cloudy days. Uh, the red line is the temperature from hour to hour throughout this whole period. And the black line is barometric pressure. And that squiggly with all the arrows down low, that is your wind speed and direction. It's all right there in one page. Just about everything that you need to know that you can say make some good decisions is all on that page. And this is the Underground Weather website 10 day forecast. Also on this same website, I like to use what they have to call the daily history. This guy right here, this is what happened that day. This is a 24 hour period from midnight to midnight. And the top square gives you your temperature from that 24 hour period and its fluctuation. The second graph is barometric pressure, then wind speed, then wind direction. And this is not a projection, this is what really happened. So let's talk about temperate bass a minute since we have such a lack of information on it. Um, the state of Kansas did its first stocking in around 1977, and they put them in Marion Reservoir. 
1977, kind of think about when some of these reservoirs were built, there's only a couple of decades for many of these reservoirs of, of age. So they really were just starting to settle down from new construction and biologists were just kind of starting to figure out what they had. Well, one of the things that they had that they didn't like so well is that the shad population was pretty strong. Um, I guess that's a bad thing, you know, because they started doing some things to manage this. And one of the things is uh, uh, they started looking at the wiper possibilities. Um, wipers were actually first conceived on the East Coast. I think it was like North Carolina, South Carolina, something like that, a few years before this. So they started putting them in the lakes, started monitoring for, for control of the shad populations and for some good sport fishing. Um, a wiper will grow to 10 to 14 inches in length in its first year. It will grow to about 20 inches at the end of its second year. So it's a very fast growing fish. But then it starts to slow down from there. They call in the state of Kansas a trophy wiper is 25 inches. It takes five or six years to get to 25 inches. So two years they get to 20 and it takes another three or four years to get that extra five inches out of them so they really slow down at that point so that's kind of why there's not that many of them but when you get one you got to appreciate him because he's an old guy and he's been around for a while the um, the smaller one year maybe the two up to two year they prefer shad size about two inches to three and a half inches. So your fly length should be somewhere in that two to three and a half inch area on, on shad patterns. Um, there's another class size of shad that would be abundant and that's the five to seven inch range and the trophy size seem to prefer that size. So if you was to have coverage from two to five or six inches, you'd, you'd be covered pretty good in about any scenario. So what we'll be talking about today is information that's compiled by personal experiences that were put to written record, numerous trips by tips provided by area fish biologists on weekly fishing reports, developing an understanding of weather conditions and the effect on fish and visiting with other anglers. Temperate bass, sometimes called true bass, are nomadic, meaning that they really don't have or consider any place in the lake their home. They'll go anywhere. Sometimes run to schools and the larger ones sometimes prefer to break away and operate on their own. They feed as chasers where you know, like you're familiar with the largemouth bass, they're more of an ambusher, meaning that they'll kind of sit in the shadows or around some structure, and then just one quick strike out a few inches out away from them for their prey as they might meander by. These guys actually run down their prey. They run it down. Their habits on feeding on the locations change throughout the year. So we'll be talking about what happens in each season, spring, summer, and fall. There's three different fish densities that you will run into. Empty water, where there just isn't any fish. Right. I have to laugh. I've run into so many people that are really good wiper fishermen out on these lakes and You'd be surprised how many of them, one of their biggest fishing equipment pieces is a lawn chair. What they'll do is they'll fish an area for about 30 minutes and if there's no fish there, they just go sit back to their truck, grab the lawn chair, and they'll just kill about 30 minutes, not doing anything, just relaxing. And then they'll go back out and they'll do another 30 minutes. Instead of just beating the water, beating the water, they know that if there's no fish there now, they come and go. They'll come in, 
they'll spend a little time and then they go again. So if you just beat the water, beat the water, beat the water, you're gonna get tired and you might miss it. But if you do it in 30 minute increments, so to speak, you're gonna have a, you're gonna last a little bit longer and you're still gonna get your chance as they come in and out. You'll also run into just small pods or singles. And then if you're lucky, every once in a while, you're gonna maybe run into a full size school. So let's talk about the spring. Spring, we're gonna call water temperatures from 50 to 68 degrees, which we are getting ready to start on right now. I can tell you today, water temperature at 11 o'clock at El Dorado was 49 degrees. Last week it was 52, but we had a cold front and knocked it back down. 52, they were just starting to wake up, but, um, but now it went back down again. At three o'clock this afternoon, the water temperature was 51 degrees. So we had a lot of sun. We had a UV index of seven, which is really a lot, but it did warm the water up some pretty fast today. Most of the time in the spring, you think about the white bass run. This is what most anglers know and utilize, uh, fishing the rivers as they go into the lake. This is a copy of the fish biologist report uh, 4, 12, and 17. The tip is that the water temperature is close to 50 degrees and the white bass run is going to be here close. The blow up of that is the white bass spawn is getting closer as the water temperatures approach the low 50s. You can expect the run in the last half of April. Could be as late as mid-May, but it really all depends on when the water flow is right. Right now, the Nenskal River going into Cheney is 75 CFS. CFS is cubic feet per second. 75 is not enough. It was 95 about two weeks ago. It's 75 now. If we don't get any rain, by the time the water temperature gets there, it's going to be even less. Wipers also will come up into the to the rivers along with the white bass. What we like on the Ninnenskull is about 180 CFS for the white bass, about 200 CFS for the wipers. It needs about that much for them to be comfortable to come upstream. If you've ever been out there, you know that that's a sandy bottom and strong current kind of scuffs up the sand and takes it along and when it gets to the mouth of the lake, it kind of disperses out. The current starts to slow down, and whatever it picked up from previously during its rushing, it just drops it. So it gets really shallow there. It spreads out and it gets shallow. So what you're looking at maybe a five or six foot deep hole by the bridge, they got to get through about a foot of it to get to that point. So if it's only six inches, they're not gonna be interested in coming up. So that's why you need a pretty good flow. We're gonna need a good rain to get to that point. We had really good fishing last year on the Ninnskull in the spring. It was awesome. Once it gets to about 55 degrees, the wipers are gonna start coming into the, to the shallows. Um, wind blown, blown points, that's kind of the target. Uh, points like this one, which I, I borrowed from our good friends from Google Map, uh, kind of shows you the, the original layout of what to look for. Also taking that information from the state biologists, um, this was 412 of 17, and uh, highlighted areas are casting from shore and working well along windblown shorelines on main lake points. So they're giving us a tip, you know, that this is where we want to start getting, getting things rounded up. But many times when you get to reading that, it's too late. So, so uh, you got to sometimes take your own initiative and just take your best guesses and take a risk. So we got that top box right there. It shows you the point. 
The middle box is a photo that I took from the Wilson area, kind of showing the layout of what that land is like up that way. And if you take the background out and just leave the foreground and put some blue in it, this kind of gives you an idea of what a point looks like underwater. So you've got the shallow water where you wade out from, further out somewhere, however far you gotta go, the deep water staging area. Now, at Wilson, you don't have to go out that far to get to the deep water. One of my favorite places, which is now underwater, since it's back full again, but I've yelled out a guy in the boat that'd be out there about twice the distance that I can cast out. How deep is it out there? He said, I've got 30 feet. Well, you know, I'm standing in knees and he's at 30 feet. So you know that that drop off is, is out there. And, and this is good because you've got the staging area when they're not really wanting to feed. And when they want to come up to feed, they come into the shallows where, where we can reach them at. So I know what you're thinking. So what's so special about the shallows and windblown points and Chad, well, you know, you know, you know the wipers are there for one reason, and that's the feed. So what brings the shad up into this area to expose himself? Why, why would they even do that? Well, sometimes they're pushed up there by, by a group of wipers, but many times when I'm out there on the points, I'm only going to run into a small pod or a single or two of the wipers, and they're not, that isn't enough of them to push shad around. So the shad are coming up on their own too. Um, you know, you might be considering that maybe it's the spawning time for them. But, you know, when you think about what they eat, um, I don't know what they eat, but I'm sure it's plankton or algae or something like that. It, if you've gone to like a, like Marion, and when they got the blue green algae, and you know how it builds up on the surface and and it's from shore and it goes out 10, 12 feet or so. Well, it hasn't grow right there. It was actually blown in. So when these small particles are blown in, they stop at the shoreline and then they start concentrating and they start getting a lot of plankton and algae in that area. And so this gives the shad an opportunity to, to, to raid the cupboards because there's a lot of food for them trapped in there and they'll take the risk for that. At least that's my theory. I think it's a pretty good one. So wind, wind and fly fishing in the great. My friend, my enemy. How much wind is needed? Not 40 miles an hour like this photo is shown right here. We like 15 to 20 miles an hour. This is necessary to bring singles in close, 15 to 20 miles an hour. Higher speeds gives these singles and small pods the advantage on feeding. And we'll get to that, where the, how, where the advantage comes from here in a little bit. The larger the schools, the less wind you need to, for them to come in. So here we go, getting analytical on you. Based on a three-year study, 2015, 16, and 17, over uh, four lakes during the spring, this is what the results were. Starting with 50 to 54 degrees. Now these, these temperatures are exact. The dates are averaged out and kind of just proportioned out a little bit because from year to year they really change. But uh, 50 to 54 degrees, um, March 8th to April 13th, 53% um, signifies the number of times I connected with wipers. The 1.6 is the average number of fish I caught during this temperature. Moving on, 55 to 57 degrees, things start heating up. I always talk about 
things start heating up at 55 degrees. This is where it starts heating up right here. 100% of my time and my numbers per trip start coming up, 1.8. This is the optimum time from 58 to 63 degrees is your best time efficient. Um, the numbers are up, they're more dependable. 64 to 66 degrees, you can still catch them, but you're gonna have days when you're not gonna be catching anything. They're, they're not quite as dependable. Once it gets to 67 degrees, they're done. There's new things that come in, um, and the wipers just don't hang in the shallows during this time period. I wanted to make a special note that the times that I did not have 100% success were sometimes where the wind speeds were under 13 miles an hour. So again, wind plays a big role in, in how successful you're going to be. Also, uh, many times I might have been out there under the influence of a cold front. So here's that classic weather map I was telling you about. Take a look right there in that black circle. We are uh, in a big high pressure bubble um, on, on this particular day, and uh, that wasn't a good day. Big high pressure bubbles look like this. It's a bluebird day. Oh, it's nice outside. Oh, it's great to be outside. Clear skies, high UV index, and calm winds. All bad for wiper fishing. So if you're gonna fish on that day, and I understand, you fish on a day when you got time, when you can get a day off from work, when, you, when it's a weekend, but what I'm hoping is that you'll have kind of a background on when you get the itch to fish for wipers, you know when it's gonna be worth going out for it. And if you have a day like this, go bass fishing, go, get, go fish for smallies. This is a good smallie fishing day. Um, they, smallies like, uh, they like clear water and they don't like to get bounced around in big waves, so. That large mouth don't like those conditions. Large mouth don't. Okay, well, the smallies. They don't like the bright sunshine. Yeah, yeah, probably so. So you just have to catch up earlier or later in the day. But what happens when you get to above 65 degrees is you're gonna start seeing carp in the shallows, and that's the sign that the spring season for wiper fishing in the shallows is over. Time to move on. So at this point, uh, I don't know. I can, if you've got some questions right now, we can kind of talk about questions a little bit. Um, if uh, we want to take a break and move around a little bit. I had one question. That when you talk about uh, 58 to 63 degrees good for the wipe of fishing, is that air temp or water temp? Because you were talking water temp earlier. Yeah, this is water temperature. Water temperature. And when I take uh, the reading, um, I've got just a regular old standard thermometer and I'm standing in knee deep water and I hold it under water for about the count of 30. And I, I'm, I'm uh, consistent with that and that's what it's based off of. So. You said they were introduced, where are they indigenous to? Well, wipers were man-made. Um, white bass are natural in the state of Kansas. They, they were here. Um, but they took the white bass and the striper bass and combined them into a hybrid. A hybrid. So, good question. I forgot to mention that. Do the wipers reproduce? Um, they're not supposed to, but I've, I've read stuff from that biologists make, you know, the reports and the like, and they believe there's a small amount of, of success on that. Just exactly what you got from it, uh, there's no record of that, but they believe that it's a possibility, but it's very slim. They're not supposed to reproduce. What were they trying to do? 
to achieve by <coughs> and easily obtained sport fish. We got big. Bigger than a white bass. Right. Okay, yes. The, uh, um, basically, a wiper is a white bass on steroids. They're going to get bigger, they're stronger, they're faster, they're more aggressive, all the good stuff. This is where you tell us after the break, like on TV, you're going to show us the, the gear that you intentionally. We're not going to be talking about gear today, but I do have some stuff over here you might be interested in when we're all done. I would also say I've read the uh, newsletter, which it seems to be uh, uh, big and exciting this month, and there was a lot of nice pictures of your wiper stuff in there. Everybody saw that this month's newsletter? The, the flies. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a bigger selection out here that we'll all be able to take a look at when we're done. So, um, the, the presentation is basically about how to connect with them, and we go from there. So, Wichita Point, Cheney, uh, what would be the points that you would say to go to in the next week or so at Cheney? Um, M and M point. M and M, that's your trade secret. We'll be talking about that here in a little bit. Okay. Are you going to talk about the depth at which you fish for these wipers? I cast out to probably five or six feet of water depth, and I fish maybe. Two foot down from the surface. Okay. Because there, if if you're out there enough, you'll see the bait fish in their habits. The bait fish in the shallows are pretty much just under the surface of the water. They're not. They're not. You know, I don't know. I guess maybe they could be out there deep, but I, I sure see a lot of activity in the shallows of the bait fish being just below the surface. For whatever reason, maybe that's the best feeding area. I don't know. With the wind being a factor for casting, but yet needed for the white bass, are you casting primarily directly into the wind? You quartering the wind with most of the power? If you're standing on a point. And it comes back around here, and you got water over here, water all the way across, and you got the wind blowing straight in on you. I like to cast into the wind, and then I'll, I'll clock it this way, right handed, and then I'll clock it this way, left handed, because you always want the fly to blow away from, away from you. So um, if you don't want to cast left handed, you're going to have to figure out something else, either crossbody or or deliver on a backstroke, or or position yourself to where you can stay right-handed. You know, just move your body further, and so you can always cast in that locked position. And some of us prefer to cast left-handed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Hey, Doug? Yes. I was going to ask you, when you cast in the wind, do you uh, use a heavier weighted rod or do you keep it the same weight? I like to cast a seven weight rod with eight weight line. The line I use is a, a heavy headed line uh, so that it can support a strong cast. It doesn't break down and it also can support fairly good sized fly. When you cast into the wind, you have to narrow your loop. You've got to squeeze that loop down and you've got to change your trajectory from just parallel to a downward slamming it onto the water. And then you've got to speed up the cast. You've got to cast, to make the line cast faster 
to create the energy. But those are the three main things to cast into the wind that help you. How far is your normal cast got to be? I mean, the fish coming in 30, 40 feet from you, or you need to go cast 60 no, feet into the wind? That's a crazy question to answer because I have hooked up just before I raised the fly out of the water, and I've hooked up right after my best 75 foot cast. So I believe that you really need to get out there as far as you can go and then present all the way in, because if you just did halfway, you've covered less water and they're gonna follow it. You know, they're, they're not going to maybe get it right away. They're going to they're going to follow it for a little bit and then finally make a decision. So you've got to get into their area, and and that area could be 70 feet. So you know, you need to just cast as far as you can get it out there. Further out there, the better chance you're going to have of of connecting it through that presentation some way. Okay, summer patterns. Water temperatures will climb up into the 80s. Temperate basses will spend most of their time in the depths of the main lake, forming the largest schools of the year to pack hunt the shad. Gulls and terns are actively feeding on the surface in the center of the lake from shad being pushed to the surface. Our own Ken McCluskey, retired fish biologist, told me about what happens in open water. They'll pack in schools and they'll start in one big circle and they'll start swimming around in this circle and that circle just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and this balls up the bait fish and they got it surrounded and then, then they push it to the surface. And the gulls are going to be your sign on that. So, you know, you'll, if you you out there in the summer, you're going to see them feeding out there in the middle of the lake if you're in a boat. And if you can get up on them, um, sometimes these events don't last very long. Uh, a few minutes, um, 30, 45 minutes if you're lucky. But uh, that's the game in the summertime. Uh, you basically have to be just chasing them in the boat. The, the boater people are, are on for the summers. But late summer, when the water temperatures start to drop, things start uh, happening that are different. Biologist tip showed up on the fishing reports. Look for the wipers and white bass on points and underwater humps. Also keep an eye out for them chasing shad near the surface. And this was uh, 825. So this was actually last August. And, uh, and so this was Cheney. This was reporting on Cheney. So I went out there. And uh, this is what, uh, what it looks like. I'm at this point. Um, it's to to the west. It's pretty shallow. Uh, that crescent shape. It's waist deep, and this is a good time to really start talking about water surface elevation. Um, you, each lake has a conservation level that they try to manage their water flow to keep that level. Um, you know, it raises. If, uh, they, if, if there's too much water and they, have, and they can't drain it away, then of course, you know, you flood and then, you know, they drain it down to conservation level. Sometimes if they anticipate a lot of rain coming, they'll drain it down a little bit extra so that they get some capacity to take on a big rain without letting it out. So, so this particular time period, water depths during the lake elevation of 1420 which is close to normal level or conservation level. And this is important to know because we're talking about this crescent as waist deep. Well, if it's two feet above conservation level, 
you're not going to probably wait it because it's going to, to me, it's going to be right at my waders. So, so always kind of, when you start doing your own research on this, water level at the time that you're fishing it is a good thing to start tracking too. This area, the, the oval area, is a one underwater hump. And although you've got this waist, waist deep channel right there, this hump is only calf deep. It pops right up. It's almost to the water surface. In fact, when the waves roll across it, you can see the waves change as it goes across this hump. And then to the north of this hump is kind of a tapering slope. It goes from, from calf deep to knee deep. And kind of give you an idea of where 100 yards is, I'm kind of estimating about how far it's out. You know, there's people out here <coughs> waiting that are fishing, and they look really small out there. You kind of wonder, oh, how the heck? But it, it's, it, it's shallow in that area. What's the bottom Sorry. It's dirt, but it's not <coughs> silty. <coughs> You don't sink in it. Uh, the distance between the uh, between the shore and the, and the underwater hump, what is that depth? What is the depth, or how far out is it? Well, how deep? I mean, can you wait out there? Or you have yeah, to yeah. If you go straight from the from the from the point out to there, you'll get into the waist deep, and then you'll start climbing up, and you'll get to calf deep. Okay. So just keep going. Is, it, is this M and M point? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so wind speed, fifteen to twenty miles an hour. Let's keep that in mind. Um, this point likes southeast or south wind direction. Again, this uh, this picture comes from our friend from Google Maps, a little snip from them. All right, so this is what happens. Um, the white bass start pushing the shad through this waist deep channel and push him up toward the, sh the, the shallows here, the, uh, the calf deep hump and then that slope right there. And when you got the wind blowing from the south to the north, they're actually pushing the shad against the wind. This, uh, this restricts their ability to escape much more. So um, this is one reason why the wind is also important is because it restricts their, the shad speed and the wipers can overcome that speed and so can the white bass. So, so they got the advantage. So let's talk about birds just for a minute. Um, this is how this, the, the pattern would go. And this was any, any normal day this time of year, it was the same way. Nine o'clock in the morning, the shore birds would kind of start the stage. If you see the circles there, they're just sitting around, not doing too much. About 10, 15, they start getting restless. Uh, they just kind of start flying around. They're not really looking down, but they're just, you can tell that they just don't want to sit there. They're kind of getting in the mood, so to speak. About 10.30, there's a whole lot more of them, and they start getting birdy. They're actually, you can see their necks craning down, and they're looking, and, and, um, and they're starting to get in positions, and there's a whole lot of them. And then about 11 o'clock, Every day is when things start happening. They start, the white bass have got the, the shad pushed into this channel and, and the birds got the opportunity to feed off of it. Now, of course, this 11 o'clock, what's the key thing about 11 o'clock? Um, it's because that's when the wind speed was kicking up. You know, nine o'clock you'd have about a five or six or seven mile per hour wind, and then it starts building and building. And by 11 o'clock, you could be 
15, 18 mile an hour, and that's enough to start the process. And this, but they would make multiple passes. This scenario of them being pushed through this deep channel, um, some days, cloudy days, that one push could last a couple hours. Those are the good days. Those are the days that you really catch them. Um, other days, they might pass through this in 30 minutes or so, and you have a hard time keeping up with them. You know, you, you try and position yourself, and, and just before you know it, they're gone, and there's no stragglers. You know, some days they're stragglers, but when they're really moving fast like that, there are no stragglers. So now are you gonna just run like crazy in the water and try and get ahead of them again? It's, uh, it's kind of tough to do. But thankfully, on those fast trips through, you wait about 30 minutes, get your lawn chair out, and the whole cycle starts over again. The birds start staging, then they start getting restless, then they start getting birdie, then they start feeding. That same cycle goes over, and it can go two or three times in an afternoon like that. So here is me standing in this trough, and the birds are coming for me. See if you can see them. Pretty exciting. You know that the white bass are just about to get to you. You see some of them start diving in. That's what it looks like from ground, from water level. At this point, I would like to mention, since we're kind of talking about this white bass study that I've done. Um, wipers and white bass sometimes mingle. So it'd be good to know how to tell the difference. Uh, the wipers, they've got a, a two-part patch on their tongue. The white bass have a one-part, only one patch. So that's the difference. And it's kind of weird, but I have never seen a fish smaller than 14 inches have a two patch on their tongue. So I don't know if they got to reach 14 inches for that to actually separate, or the wipers smaller than that just don't play the game right now. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know that one. Is that the only way you can tell the difference? Um, you can tell the difference by the way they fight. <laughs> you know, once you've caught a few of them, you'll know. That, yeah, you'll, you'll know you'll have a wiper on before you get it to hand. Because there's a whole together different okay. attitude going on on the other side of that fly. Right? Yeah. Are there different regulations for the two species? Yes. Um, if you was to keep them, uh, wipers, only two at Cheney or most any place around here, and they have to be 21 inches long or longer. Uh, white bass, I don't know if there is a limit. And there was certainly no limit in size. In numbers, I'm not sure. I, I never keep them, so I, I, I don't know. Do you need to tell them apart? Yes. It, that way you can say, I caught a white bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Not a white bass, who's a wiper? Okay, um, so this is the time period on this little summer study that I did on m, &M Point. Um, August 25th through October 17th. Uh, each day that has a blue X on it was a day that I was out there on the water and there's three cold front lines on three dates that uh, came through 
and we want to kind of talk about the effects that the cold front done during this time period. So starting out here on the uh, <clears throat> September 19th through the 23rd, the, uh, the water temperatures were 74, 75, 75, and 76. On the 19th, outside temperature was 94 degrees. On the 20th, when the cold front came through, outside air temperature was 85 degrees and then 91 degrees and then 87 degrees. On the 19th, it was an average day. I got five white bass, so it was, it was a good day. Um, fishing on the day of the cold front was a poor day of fishing, zero fish. Um, the 21st, um, <coughs> best day, 14 white bass. And on the 23rd, and again, an average day of about five. So what I'm, all this information is telling us is the day of the cold front made an impact on your possibilities of catching fish, but it did not affect the day before the cold front and it did not affect the day after the cold front. Um, it did not, the cold front did not affect the water temperature. This is key. It was a mild cold front that came through. It really didn't change all the, the, the consistency of the, of the situation. Where on this event, um, when the cold front came through, uh, it was a big one. Uh, we got 1.3 inches of rain. Uh, outside temperatures were in the mid 50s. Um, wind from the north most days, lake level rose six inches, and finally started to level out after several days, and went back out on the water on the sixth, and it was a good day, 12, 12 white bass. But any time before that was still in the effects of the cold front, and was affecting the fishing. So cold front, strength is going to be key onto whether you're it's going to mess up your fishing before or after that. <coughs> Did the wind change to the south after the cold front? <coughs> it went back and forth and back and forth. It never was consistent one way or the other. On this last one, this last cold front, there's a big northerner and uh, there was snow in northwest Kansas 48 degree air temperature. Um, water temperature was already getting messed up. We were getting down to mid 60s and uh, even down to 62. And all those days were poor fishing. Um, so I ended the study right there and went to El Dorado and started <coughs> fishing for wipers. So what did we learn from this? We learned that tempered bass, although we're chasing feeders, they prefer conditions which create obstacles or barriers that aid in chasing down the bait fish. Underwater humps or other instruction, obstructions under the surface, like rock piles, stone fences, and roadways. They also need barriers like the water surface or the aid of high winds to push the bait fish into, which gives them the advantage. Also, we've learned that it's hard to be successful fishing for wipers in lakes during cold front affected periods. The stronger the cold front affects longer, it takes the fishery to recover. This is important. When the day's highest temperature does not reach the current water temperature, fishing will be poor, I guarantee it. So if you've got a water temperature of 50 degrees, and the day you want to fish is being forecast at 48, do something else. You, you, won't, you won't be catching any fish. At least no wipers or white bass. I don't know about any of the other stuff. Got another picture here of the classic weather map. Kind of always want to keep that in front of you so that you kind of get used to looking at that. Again, this is from the Weather Channel. 
this particular front was a stationary. That's why it's blue and red. I'm going to talk a little bit about the 10-day uh, forecast. This is, again, snipped from the underground weather website. Um, we had a cold front on this first day, the one that's in the shaded oval, and kind of look and see after that. Um, I got a few days that are shaded a little bit. Look, look what it did. I mean, we'd have a decent pattern first two days, and then we take out another dip in there. And uh, look what it did to the to the barometric pressure, the, the black line. Um, there were several days in a row when it just kept going down. When you want to talk about barometric pressure and what it affects the fishing, the the natural cycle of barometric pressure is at sunrise it starts. To climb. Around noon it hits its peak and in the afternoon it starts to fall till maybe an hour or two before sunset when it levels off and starts to climb again. This is a normal barometric pressure cycle day. But when you have days in a row when it never raises back up, and just each day just kind of drops further and further. That is, that is the, the barometric falling scenario. And that is not good for fishing either. What is good for fishing is consistency. The black straight line is my water temperature of 76 degrees. Uh, the top line is the up and down highs and lows. And look how balanced that is. You've got the lows about as far away from the water temperature as the following day's high. And it's each day it's very similar. Um, the barometric pressure line is basically doing almost the same thing. <clears throat> there is not several days in a row of it falling. It goes up and it goes down. And it does its normal cycle. This is consistency, and this is what you're looking for on the 10-day forecast. You're looking for consistency so you can plan your week out. Okay, now we're moving into fall. Um, you know, my white bass adventure is getting down to about 65, 66 degrees. So, so the summer pattern was breaking off, and so now we want to kind of start talking about what happens in the fall water temperature 68 to 40 degrees. Um, you'll want to wear warm clothes because it's going to be kind of chilly at times. And we want to talk about the best times for this one too. So 68 to 62 degrees, um, you have good chances, you have chances of catching some good fish. Um, 61 to 54 degrees, the last three years, the weather pattern has been really stupid, really crazy. No consistency, so my numbers aren't as good. You would think they would be good. That's, that's good water temperature, but you know, cold front affected periods, like what we talked about, makes a difference, even if you've got good water temperature. When things start straightening up and you start getting consistency in your water temperature or in your air and, and cold front stuff again, um, we can get back into the optimum times, 53 to 46 degrees. These are good times to be out there on the water. And, you know, at basically after 45 degrees, it, it's done. You're, you're basically done. Nothing, nothing consistent, nothing you can predict at this point. So let's kind of talk about that daily history that's on the Underground Weather Channel. Um, that top bar, uh, the red line, is the 24-hour period of, of air temperature. 
Then you've got, in the second bar, you've got the barometric pressure. Third bar, you've got wind speed. Fourth bar, you've got wind direction. So this particular day was a good day. Um, you look at the barometric pressure, it leveled off uh, when it's supposed to level off and kind of started climbing when it's supposed to climb. Um, so the, the barometric pressure was not a negative on this day. Uh, wind direction or wind speed, um, the middle part of the day, it rose to its peak and then it started to fall off again. So let's look at December 1st. This was a day that I was out on the water, caught a lot of fish. Uh, the blue line is a water temperature line that is 50 degrees and air temps was 54 to 60 degrees during the time that I fished. The time of the day that I fished is in the little square box uh, from 1030 to roughly 215 area. That is the time that I was on the water and that was the time that I really did a good, had a good success. Uh, barometric pressure uh, was in a normal cycle. Wind speed was kicking up during this time and, and was strong enough that uh, helped with my success. Um, direction was consistent, wasn't uh, switching around, going southeast and back to south. It was staying consistent. But you're wondering what that star is for. Here's a close up of water temperature. 50 degree straight line, air temperature at its lowest in the 24 hour period and at its highest in the 24 hour period. And look how similar in consistency from, from the water temperature line. And that star is right on where water temperature and air temperature are the same number. For some reason, and I can't explain it, and I can't really tell you why, but I have caught some of my biggest fish when that star is on. When I'm, I've got balanced temperature change for the day, that's what I call balanced temperature change, and I'm on the water when when the air temperature meets the water temperature, magic happens at times. I've seen the biggest fish of 20 inch smallmouth bass, 25 inch vipers. Some of my biggest fish happen at the star. So be aware of that scenario. I mean, it's kind of like Santa Claus and Easter Bunny, but um, it, it's got me convinced. Another look at it again. All right, this is a different day. This is November 3rd and a success rating of poor. I, ca I caught no fish that day. And let's take a look at what might have happened. Water temperature was 48 degrees and the air temperature never reached water temperature. Air temperature did never reach or go above water temperature. Parametric pressure, erratic, spiky, wind, erratic, spiky. Um, nothing's consistent on this day. Uh, and it was a cold day versus the water temperature. So, so that's another, another bad day of fishing. That's, that's where I'm coming from. The air temperature doesn't reach water temperature. Um, go do something else. This on him and him? This is in Kansas. This happens everywhere. This is not. This, I know it's the wind out north. That's why. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. A lot of this information is from Wilson, Marion, Cheney, El Dorado. So you know they they all kind of act the same. They all, they all have the same, same fields. Okay, just a quick little thing that happened here. This is 
two 10 day forecasts that I pasted together. Um, the dark day was a cold front day. The, uh, the lighter shaded days are days that I was on the water fishing and the information above each day shows the water temperature, the day, uh, the time of day that I fished and, uh, and if it was a good day, best day, poor day. So uh, again, we had a cold front come through on that, on that dark shade, um, looking at what it did with the, the barometric pressure. You know, we see no consistency in a 24 hour period on barometric pressure. Um, and this is, this is when it affects the fishing We now understand wind and water temp a little bit better. What about glare? What are some of the things that can control glare? Uh, time of year, the visibility rating, and UV index. And we all know as trout anglers that glare makes fish spooky and wary. Uh, it affects their eyesight just like it does ours, uh, they just can't, aren't comfortable in that environment because they're losing a, a small amount of their vision. Um, and when it affects my vision, then I know that there's too much glare. Uh, if, I, if I leave the sunglasses in the car and I wish I had them, there's probably too much glare in the water. So I started using the UV index as a unit of measure. Um, because I needed something substantial. I mean, if I'm working with time of year, um, you know, distance of clarity and UV index, that I'm just trying to simplify it. And the UV index, when I started tracking that, um, that, that seemed to be the best thing. Um, I like days, I like to fish days when the UV index is two or less. It was seven this afternoon. So I've got this little tool here. This is kind of the, the, the gypsy ball, you know, so to speak. Um, it, it tracks three categories. Uh, you've got glare, and the optimum glare is zero on the UV index. Optimum, optimum water temperature is 61 degrees in the spring and 51 degrees in the fall. Optimum wind speed is 18 miles an hour. And each one of these categories has a scale. Um, UV index starts at, at the point at zero and goes into the center at three. And then uh, water temperature one to eight and wind speed from 20 down to nine. I've got this center kind of black hole a little bit. Um, when all three readings are in this black hole, it's going to be a poor day of fishing. Uh, if you're, if it's a, if it's a, like we talked about earlier, the, the high bubbles, um, this is probably a high bubble day. Now, you don't have to be optimum on all categories. You can be middle on all categories and still have a good day of fishing. Uh, partly cloudy or a, just a veil of light clouds. Um, instead of 51 degrees in the fall, maybe you're at 55. That's not going to hurt you. 16 mile an hour winds when everything else is pretty average and okay, that's going to be fine for you too. So you can go strong on one of these categories like a 20 mile per hour wind and you can give up some glare and you can give up not quite the exact water temperature and still have a good day of fishing. It works the other way too. If you've got two optimum readings, you can almost go into the black on one of them and still have a good day. So this is kind of a tool that you can use to, to look at the weather and kind of see if it's something that, uh, that you should catch some fish that day or not. Lastly, um, we want to talk about picking the time of days to go. Um, 
basically my shifts that I kind of fish around is 9 to noon, 11 to 3, 2 to 5. If we look at the, uh, the survey, most everybody likes that sunrise to 10 o'clock, and then the second favorite is just before sunset. Uh, nobody really likes to fish so much in the middle of the day, although there are times when that is really good for wiper fishing because the wind's up at that point. So this is uh, December 3rd, and I had a good day of fishing that day. This is uh, the actual hour by hour of that day, and it's the actual time that I was on the water, 11 to 3. And why did I pick that time? I had good cloudy conditions. Um, the air temperature was comfortable and I had good wind speed at that point. So this is the tool that I use to pick what time of days I want to be on the water. And then you can kind of plot it out on, on the little triangle too that way. Where, where do you get your UV index from? The, uh, Everybody's got that weather app. Uh, it's going to be on the weather app. Um, also, you just go on uh, uh, Weather Channel and uh, you'll have a UV index on that. Also, if you just search UV index forecast, there's a website that will give you like three days in a row of what to expect on the UV. It'll tell you your highs, the highest point of the day, and it'll tell you the lowest part of the day. So. That'd be a good planner, but if you just search UV index forecast for that, you get a three-day planner. Well, yes? How did you get your water temperature? Water temperature, I've got just a standard, regular old thermometer, and I stand knee deep in the water, and I stick it in the water, and I hold it for a count of 30. And I do that every time. So that I'm consistent on that. And that's how I get the water temperature. Pretty much stays the same. Yeah. It, it's going to get colder the further out you go and the deeper you go. But you know, if I stay knee deep, then then I'm consistent and, and I and I know what happened last week on fifty two degrees. And I got 52 degrees the same way. I've got the same water water temperature conditions. More questions? What, in your opinion, is urban pressure? Here's a theory on barometric pressure. One atmosphere is always there. Right. So, so um, the the story on on what barometric pressure does to fish is when the barometric pressure falls, it swells their air bag up, and it just like they've got a bad mood. They're just not in the mood to do anything. And so, but to get comfortable, they go deep, like what you were saying. They find, they go deep till they can get comfortable. Uh, if they can't go deep enough to get comfortable, they just stay in a foul mood till the barometric pressure comes back up again. Now remember I talked about a normal cycle on barometric pressure does go up and down throughout the day. That isn't enough to really affect it. I, had some of my best days in the afternoon when the cycle is actually starting to drop down, but it ain't dropping down fast enough or far enough. But when we were looking at some of those 10 day forecasts and there was like two or three days in a row that it was going down, that's, that's when this scenario kicks in. That's, that's when falling barometric pressure affects the fishing is when it's 
growing down day after day after day after day. That answer? Yeah. I just read a number of articles that, that the studies that would happen were in salt water and the guy is saying the article I read the most of said the primary pressure had no effect. They fish by the moon. We don't. Um, or at least I don't. I don't know if anybody else does. But um, they fish the moon for for tidal conditions. So uh, fishing is regional. Do you, any, do you have any tips on? Uh, I'm finding lots of hybrids in so many small creeks around here, waterways you wouldn't think there's hybrids in. Do you have any uh, tips on that? You know, as far as uh, do you fish any of the rivers or small creeks, the walnut, the, do you fish any of these? Mostly I fish the inlets, like we talked about earlier, the, the rivers going into the reservoirs, and I fish the outlets. Um, the outlets, I never really talked about this, but the outlets are a good source of fishing too. Um, when they release water. Uh, if, you, if they're releasing a good amount of water, the fish are coming through the dam and then they're going to be there and guess what? Stunned bait fish go through too and it's just a feeding gorge for them. So it's pretty good fishing during that time. But when there's no big releases, then there's no fish. I mean, that water can get sterile. They get all caught out and there's nothing in it. Uh, as far as what you're talking about, um, yes, white bass and wipers can be in the river year round. Uh, I, I like to swing like a wet fly for them. That's my tactic. That's my preferred tactic is a quarter across and swing it down on the current if you've got a current. Uh, you were, you know, like uh, you go to, to to southeast Kansas and you're fishing for uh, spotted bass in the creeks and rivers there. They don't chase. You, you swing a fly across there and they can chase it. You have to do other stuff to get them to go. But but because the temper bass are chasers, remember they're chasers. They can a swinging fly works good for them. Uh, also. Um, well, I've got a selection of flies over here. Some of them are for still water. Some of them are moving water. There's a reason why there's a difference. And if we go, if we go around to the table over here, uh, I can kind of point that out to you and we can talk about the, the characteristics of, of these. So, um, if, and we can answer questions as we go too, but let's go ahead and move over to the table over here. 